Welcome back to Contractor Evolution. This is Benji, and today is part two of a two-part conversation with Mark C. Winters, author of Rocket Fuel and the foremost expert on visionary integrated relationships. If you haven't listened to part one yet, go do that now. It will be the prior episode to this in whatever feed you're currently on. If you have heard part one, we're going to pick up essentially where we left off last time and go deeper on a few things. Uh, where visionaries should search for the right integrator, both inside their organization and outside their organization. We'll talk about how to quantify your visionary integrator fit using assessments and your core values. Uh, we'll get into the five rules you need to follow to maintain a healthy VI relationship over the long run. And lastly, we'll talk about what to do when visionaries or integrators for that matter outgrow one another, which is part of the story too. Now, a final note. If you're a Breakthrough Academy member and this conversation resonates you this week's, last week's, please don't run to your coach as soon as you finish this pod and yell, I need an integrator and all my problems will be solved. These relationships, as we discussed today, take a long time to get right. And the systems you're implementing right now are exactly what your integrator will need to be effective when you do find them anyway. So by all means, bring this up with your coach, but keep doing what you're doing too. I hope you like part two of my conversation with Mark C. Winters. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Okay, so one of the things that uh, like everyone is gonna be asking, um, is where do I find one? And I have a feeling you probably spend a lot of time answering this question for people through your work. You organize the thinking, and I'll, and I'll, sh I'll just set this up well because this is sort of how it's discussed um, in Rocket Fuel. There's, you know, there's really two places inside the organization or outside the organization where you can find an integrator. Um, it, let's let's talk about inside the organization first, um, and then we'll go outside. If you are a business that farm raises talent and you are oriented to develop people into higher and higher roles, can you maybe talk about the certain, the very specific traits this visionary leader would be looking for within certain people on their team? What are they exhibiting? What are they showing? And do they happen to exist in, do they tend to exist in certain roles or certain divisions within the business? Okay, so there's a ton of different directions we can go with this question, this topic. And so okay. we're, we're starting, it sounds like, from the visionary asking the question, where do we find one? Yes. And if I'm looking internally, uh, you know, some things to think about. But the, the there's a couple of fundamental things I want to clear up. Okay. So, so the first one is this question of, you know, finding the other, it, it actually can originate from both sides. So the integrator kind of has their version of this question, too, that we can get to if you want to. We'll get to that. Mm -hmm. From the visionary side, it really starts with uh, with self assessment. So it's you know first before I try to think about what I'm looking for, I've got to look at what I need. So go back to that three piece puzzle, okay? So if I've got again the three pieces, so the two pieces of the visionary and the integrator, the one piece that's the business, and these three pieces have to fit together. Well, if I'm the visionary, okay, I got to really understand me. I've got to understand what this shape of my edge looks like. And I need to understand for the integrator, the missing integrator piece I'm trying to find in this case, I need to understand what the shape of that integrator edge uh, to the business looks like. Then with that missing piece, if I know those two things, I know the shape of what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I, I know what we need that I'm looking for. So in the self-assessment for the visionary go things like doing the wish list, uh, you know, personality profiles, different kind of Colby, culture index, strength finders, you know, disc, you know, whatever, just things to kind of understand who I am, how I'm wired. We go through that exercise we talked about with how much integrator does this business need. And that begins to kind of shape what I'm looking for. At the core are all the things that we talked about before. They must be the shining example of what we call leadership management and accountability. Mm -hmm. They have to set the tone for the entire organization for that. So they got to be great at it. They got to love having the hard conversation, asking the hard question. I mean, not just, uh, 
you know, do it because they have to, but they just, they just, again, it has to be in there, in their wiring, follow through details, execution, all of that stuff is kind of core to any of them. But then around that, you know, how are they going to be able to work with a visionary like me? Uh, how are they matching up with the integrator spectrum that we have in our company in terms of skills? Are they a project manager or are they a, you know, a leader of a large scale organization? You know, which seems like kind of their, you know, where they're at their you know, the experience, the, the, the training, the expertise that they bring that goes with that. Uh, so that's how we back into it to, to, to okay. figure out what we're looking for. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. Would you make the case that my my question is maybe going in the wrong direction? Like I'm sort of like perhaps this is naive, but I'm going like, well, like are they really talented project managers or like, hey, if you have a really strong office manager who's good at attention to detail, do you just pluck them up and train them for two years and poof, you have an in, like an, an integrator? I mean, would you make the case that that's a little bit too black and white or t- too simplistic of a of you towards this? Yeah. I would say it this way. It's stru- structure first, people second. So clarify what you need first mm. and then go see if you can find it mm. rather than looking at what you've got and thinking if I can work with that. Because here's the other trap right. that people run into is I'm a, I'm a visionary sitting in the integrator seat and I'm hating life because I'm working my tail off. I'm 90% of the stuff I'm doing I don't like. And I maybe, again, I'm not great at it. And so I got to get out of the seat. This is killing me. I got to get an integrator. All right. Uh, you can fog this mirror, right? And yeah, I can see you're already here and you're not going to cost me a lot. And you know, I can do give you a little bit of training and whatever. And let's just put you in there, see if it works. Because I've it, seen this it, happen so many times, Mark. I've seen this, so, I, especially <laughs> in our little, especially in our little world, I've seen in particular um, a really strong administrator who, you know, happens to, you know, show the visionary a few organized spreadsheets, a base level competence for the CRM, some good inbound phone call stuff. And they go, there's my person. And a year and a half later, they've been elevated up the ranks of the org chart, perhaps too quickly. And now they're in a complete and total state of overwhelm going, I actually didn't ask for this. Yeah. And um, th- that is a very, th- those can lead to some very painful offboardings. Yeah, and and the you know the pain on the front end that they were experiencing when they made that call uh, creates ten times as much pain on the back end, right. and for the rest of the organization. So so it's just it's making it visible for people to see that, for visionaries to see that, and just really, you know, uh, pleading for them to take the time to be thorough about what you're going to do, figure out what you need, and then be intentional about how you go looking for it, whether internal yeah. or external. Uh, please look at more than one candidate. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you didn't just, I mean, maybe that one that happens to be there right in front of you is the best one in the world. Uh, but odds are. Seems like a long the, shot. Seems like a long shot, right? And so at least have some some good options to compare to and and then really, you know, work the process. You know, another thing, Benji, that, that we strongly advocate is this, we have a, an assessment, the crystallizer. And so take that visionaries. Uh, it'll give you a visionary score and an integrator score. Any candidate that you're going to consider the, for this role, have them take that. And mm-hmm. and it's going to give you some insight. It's not the end all be all, but it's a great data point that moves you down the path of, you know, is this person the right fit for me? Is this person the right fit for us? And are they going to be able to do what we need them to do to get us where we're trying to go? So, uh- Okay, perhaps this is a better question about about the inside the organization angle, and then we'll look at the outside. Um, and maybe I don't know if you've done this in any of your businesses. Perhaps you've seen this done well in businesses you work with through EOS. But if an entrepreneur has someone talented in their in their company, but perhaps young uh, and inexperienced. I'm talking sort of still from the visionary and they see perhaps someone that could, maybe has some, they do the test and they sh- they show maybe some some early signs of of integrator orientation. How should how should a visionary nurture and develop this person into readiness considering the fact that that visionary may not have the skill set to do that nurturing for that person? Have you have you ever seen this done exceptionally well where they they farm raise someone into an integrator role? I have, uh, in fact, in a construction business. And so uh, somebody who basically started off as a project manager and then to, you know, 
project director and ultimately into the the integrator role. And so the 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 process I've seen is just a slow over time giving them more and having mm-hmm. lots of conversations without going here's the seat uh, about hey here's something I'm thinking about uh, you know and and I you know no promises uh, but I think this might be a possibility and so we'd kind of like to start having you know it's, it's almost like like mentoring and, and mentoring frankly is something that a visionary might be very good at different than holding them accountable, right? Because they're just kind of talking about them. They're talking about their experiences. They're talking about how they work. They're talking about the things that they want, the things that they see. And and so it's it's more of a teacher uh, kind of role, if that makes okay. sense. So Slow and so, steady. Slow and steady. And again, just kind of giving them more and more and more until, you know, they break and, and, and or, you know, top out. Uh, or they may thrive and, and, mm-hmm. and keep and, and keep coming down the path until ultimately they they make it all the way there. So, and and if someone you know truly does not have the person inside the organization and they need to go uh, to the outer world, right. what have you seen leads to success there when a visionary has to you know hunt for this person, search for this person? So there's, there's uh, you know, a few different ways. So one is just leverage your network. So first, assuming you've done all the internal work first, meaning, you know, I've really, uh, I understand the shape of what I'm looking for because I understand mm-hmm. myself and I understand our business. I know what I'm looking for. So once I know what I'm looking for, you know, first level is leverage your circle of reach, whatever that is, you know, whether that's, you know, LinkedIn, I mean, let people know, hey, I'm looking for an integrator. Here's a job description. We have an integrator job description that, that is available, you know, that, that you can use that generally tells here's what an integrator does in case you're talking to somebody that doesn't know. Although more and more people know, they, they know what that term is. They know what it, yes. what it, what it is. So just letting anybody and everybody that, you know, uh, be aware that, Hey, I'm looking for one. We see tons of people that actually, that's how they find them. That's how they get their candidate. Second layer from that is, uh, you know, f- fractional integrator. So this is a a term that, uh, you know, is sort of or a, really a, an offering that kind of evolved after we wrote the book where people began to offer uh, integrator services on a non full time basis. So much like you can get a fractional CFO or a fractional marketing resource, you know, anything like that. It's somebody that's uh, got a higher level of capability set than what you may be ready to bring in yeah. full time, or maybe your business doesn't need all that full time yet, uh, but you can you can engage with somebody like that, and they start the process. They start to work with you a little bit, and a lot of times, what happens in that situation is they kind of get you started. The visionary kind of begins to feel what it's like to work with somebody in that role. The team starts mm-hmm. to feel what it's like to work with somebody like in it. that role, and they and they like it. They start things start to happen. Uh, and sometimes it's even, it's like dating. So, you know, we start to work together and, and, you know, I'm with you a couple of days a week or whatever. And you realize, man, I really like having this person around here a couple of days a week. You know, I wonder, could we, maybe we make this a full-time thing and it kind of evolves to more. Uh, so we see that happen. So that's another path. And then the third path externally is, uh, is a recruiter. And so there are recruiters that have specialized in, uh, on, on making this match on integrator search. And so, yeah, you know, it's probably the most expensive way, but you know, they're going to be thorough. They're going to be faster. Again, th- you're not out there doing inter- integrator searches all the time. They are. Uh, so you get the benefit of working with somebody that really knows what they're doing. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the right option for a lot of people. And we're, you know, frankly, Benji, this is, this is a space that, that we're spending more and more time on as EOS worldwide, where we want to offer help. And we're getting really close to being able to, to, to put some offerings in the market where, uh, you know, if you are looking for, uh, your integrator match, we're going to have some, some options for you. And because that's what we see too. Somebody reads the book, Rocket Fuel, somebody gives it to a visionary. They read the first chapter. It's all about them and they love that chapter. And then they read the next chapter, right? And it's about the integrator. They're like, you know what? That sounds pretty good. I think that could help me. And then they say, where do I get one? And then that's when it kind of gets hard. But the, any, the other, the other you, thing, I just, I just got to make a plea yeah. for uh, don't give up and don't wait. So get out there and start, start looking if this is what you want. Because the other thing we learned 
is the ratio in the world is four to one visionaries to one yeah. integrator. So four visionaries to one integrator. And, and you're not a good match for all of those. So get out there and get the one that's a good match for you before somebody else does. It, it's a mathematical likelihood, just be based on what you said, that you actually are, might not find them on the first go because of the abundance of visionaries and the scarcity of, of integrators. So the sooner you get rolling on this, the better. Uh, because you might have to take a couple cracks at it, and your your resounding message here is that's okay. That's part of the process. Hang in there. Have faith that that you will find that person eventually. Do you have thoughts on uh, industry? So I'll I'll set up this question this way. We. I've uh, been working with a lot of, we've been doing a lot of uh, content around project management systems within the construction space because there's so little good stuff for our market. So we've been really trying to get, talk to some smart people and build out some SOPs and frameworks for people to follow. And uh, we've done that. We've had a few conversations, I've had a lot of conversations with, with GCs in particular about this uh, project management role. One thing they have said to me is, um, you know, one mistake that we made early on is being too myopic about I, this person needs to have X amount of years in this specific industry. And there's been a few people who have, you know, rolled the dice on someone who comes from a dental office and right. is joining a, a, a construction company, comes from events planning and is joining a construction company, a marketing firm, and they rock like they absolutely kill as a PM. Does is does the same idea apply for integrators? How much does industry knowledge and experience matter when you're searching for an in, for an integrator, or does it not? So, in, in in my experience, it's a nice to have. It's not a must have. And literally, just before we hopped on, I was recording an, ep, an episode of of our podcast, the Rocket Fuel Podcast, and it was a commercial design build firm. They're specialized, but that's basically the space they're in, and that was the story was uh, they brought in someone from uh, retail. So, you know, kind of sales and marketing background in retail. And, uh, you know, came into the company, worked in the company for a little bit on the sales and marketing side, but demonstrated the leadership capabilities and kind of the rest of the picture for what they needed and has been a, a smashing success uh, as their integrator. So... It, it happens, and, and you know it. It makes sense, right? So if you're a if you're a sales uh, professional, you can sell widgets. It doesn't really matter what right. they are, right? If you're right. A, a finance professional, you know it doesn't really matter what industry. I mean, you're, there's different nuances and all that kind of stuff, but at the core, it's kind of it's same. And for the the leadership that we need uh, that integrator to bring, it's about people. It's mm. about it's about leading and managing and holding people accountable, and it's about you know driving execution uh, through the other leaders on that leadership team. It's about being able to communicate with that visionary, stay on the same page, understand what they're saying in a way that you can translate it to the rest of the organization. So that's what's the secret sauce in there. And they'll pick up some of that industry nuance along the way. You know, trust that they will. They're an intelligent person. A year from now, they're going to know 99% as much as someone who's been in the industry for 20 years, and they'll fill the rest of that gap along the way. Those numbers aren't exact, but I would, I'd make the case that they're going to pick it up pretty quickly. Agreed. And they're in constant communication, constantly realigning with that visionary. And typically, the visionary has tons of industry experience. So that's the, that's the great source, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about onboarding, and it, because I think that this this uh, you know, mentioning some of these false starts as a part of the process, I um, have a really good rapport with one of our members, and I reached out to them. Uh, I let them know you were coming on, and I was like, "Hey, can, you know, what would you want to what would you want to ask Mark?" And so I'm going to read you this question that he wrote me in an email, and I'm changing some of the names to just keep. Privacy. Let's say his name is Jeff. It's not, but let's say this member's name is Jeff. Uh, so he goes, <clears throat> I have attempted to hire three different integrators over the last five years. I feel like these experiences have taught me a ton about how to properly implement an integrator. Specifically with Tim, I went through the process of all the assessments to see if we were a good fit. We were a perfect fit. The thing I missed on was the vision casting and onboarding process. I figured Tim was the perfect fit and he would be able to figure it out just like I did. 
Through this process, I have learned and have seen with Clark, the current integrator, that they want a very clear plan with the exact steps on what is expected. As a visionary, I suck at this. I just figure it out, and when I screw up, I learn again by trying. I am now in the process of carrying out a very detailed 30, 60, and 90-day plan with Clark, and I think it's the right way to go about it. Um, And I'm staying way more involved and giving him the responsibility once he is confident and we have a way for him to measure it. This goes again. Against every fiber in my body, spoken like a true visionary, but I feel like it is working. Uh, I have also spent a ton of time sharing vision and repeating it all the time. So the question is, as a visionary, how do you make sure the integrator has an onboarding plan that matches your vision? Yeah, so I think it's fine to let them build it, but you've got to give them the inputs. So uh, that means, you know, we talked about the 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 wish list, the visionary wish list, all these things that I wish were true. Uh, you know, the visionary needs to do that work, provide that to them. You need to spend the time talking them through, uh, you know, what the vision is and, and kind of the, the core questions that we talk about or in the EOS worldwide language, the, the VTO, the vision traction organizer, yes. work that out together. If it's, if it's not already worked out, if it is already worked out, make sure that they understand that orienting them to kind of the landscape that we're in and what the, what the current priorities are. And that, that'll help with that. And then, you know, really challenge them to come back with what that 30, 60, 90 day plan is, and then iterate to make sure that, uh, you know, it makes sense that you're aligned and, and we start off as soon as we can with, with, uh, some crystal clear expectations that we both see the same way. That's the mm. goal, right? And then from there, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna give you a triad of of power on on that uh, that onboarding, it's it's that coupled with just rock solid public support from the visionary. They they got to be right. out out front of the organization, going, "Hey, this person's here. They're the right person. We're excited. We got a plan." You know. And not doing the little things that kind of pick at them and 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 make it easy to uh, you know for the the followers the not the followers but the, really the rest of the organization that are going to be reporting up into that integrator to uh, to get wobbly. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that that makes perfect sense. You're saying a public and highly visible endorsement of this person so that everyone knows you you are in their corner, you have their back. And that's yeah. actually a harder thing to do than I than I think it seems for a lot of visionaries. Well, it's hard and it's not a one-time thing. Because right. it's it's, you know, make that that statement to the organization uh, early and often is probably a good way to think about it. So so that's got to be there. And it's also in again just reinforcing the behavior because here's what's going to happen. People are going to do end runs around that integrator. They're going to come to the visionary, and and, and the visionary is going to, out of an old habit, they're going to respond. They're going to give them the answer. They're going to give them a decision. They're going to give them direction. They're going to do all these things that we don't want them to do that are going to cut your integrator off at the knees. And so, so you, you got to work really hard on that. Mm-hmm. That, that, that um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Well, the, the third thing, just to kind of finish the thought, if I'm mm-hmm. the, kind of the three legs of the stool here, are early wins. Because you, you've got to look for, and visionaries give that incoming integrator, set them up for early success. So what could we do in that first 30 days that's going to make you look like a hero that you can get done? And I'll help you, right? So that they get that because that's more currency with the rest of the organization for them to begin to believe, for them to give them their confidence, for them to give them their trust. So crystal clear expectations, you know, uh, you know, public support that's early and often and then early, early wins that we begin to knock off. What's an example of an early win? It can be anything. I mean, here's something that we've been stuck on for a while that just hasn't been able to get done that with a little bit of of focus and and leadership is very doable. So let's knock that out. And it's something that's going to make a difference. People have been complaining about it for two years. Right. Okay, cool. But it, but it's not it's not so vast or high level or difficult or thorny of an issue that this brand new integrator is like, "Bro, I just got here." Right? Right. Right. No, yeah. and, and it's so there's another discussion there. So, no, I'm saying something that you are not a not a total gimme, but something you're mm-hmm. highly confident, you know, we can talk mm-hmm. about how to do this and we just got to do it and and then this will this will happen. So that's what we're looking for there in the early wins. They need um, the dopamine rush. They need that early, like, that's right. I did something cool. That's and right. then more importantly, the optics, the team saw that happen. And then there's a little bit of trust building. So that, yep. And then, I, and then we glad, give them another one. I'm glad you unpacked that. 
and you, yeah, give, and another give them one. another one. Um, and the other thing, just real quick, Benji, on this is the how quickly we do that ramp up is different for different organizations. So some organizations, literally, they bring the integrator in with almost a uh, watch mentality for three months, six months, maybe even a year, which is seems totally crazy to a lot of visionaries. They're paying them, but they're paying them just to be there and watch and learn and kind of take it all in, all the human dynamics that are going on, all the different kinds of things. Maybe if they're learning uh, you know, a lot of new stuff, they don't throw them right into the fire. So understand yeah. there's, there's kind of two ends of that, uh, of that option as well. Yeah. As, I as think, to how I fast think we push them in. How steep the ramp up is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's another, that's another great point. We, we've, I think we've um, stumbled into this, this next section I wanted to ask you about pretty organically when we were talking, I think you're mentioning like end runs. Um, <clears throat> long-term success. This relationship is meant to last longer than simply the onboarding period. And I'm sure that we could do an entire podcast or a few on um, on what breeds long-term success within this relationship. But there's two things from the book that I thought was really podcast-friendly content and easy to kind of work through and give people some real concrete value quickly. One is the five rules and the other is IDS. I'm not sure which one of those you want to bang off first. Well, I mean, the, the, the five rules, you know, we talked about structure. Remember when I talked about they're wired differently, naturally mm-hmm. friction. We're trying to put structure around that to, to blend it, that friction into a positive, powerful force. So the five rules, we've kind of talked about them, but just to kind of tick them off and then you dive in wherever you want. Uh, you know, the first one is to stay on the same page. So, so it's being super intentional about doing the work and we've got a you know a same page meeting discipline that we that we teach to to really become two halves of that same brain so you know we don't we do different things but you know you understand where i'm coming from i understand where you're coming from and we we, we really uh, a a same page integrator put in a situation is going to make a decision give direction much like if the visionary was right there in their ear because they already know what the visionary would think and they're going to mm-hmm. consider that in the context of whatever decision it is that they're forced to make. So that's the first rule. Second one is no end runs. So that's this thing about going around the integrator, you know, whether it's someone coming around the integrator to go to the visionary directly or whether it's the visionary doing what I call tampering where they swing around the integrator and they go down into the organization and they give direction and make decisions there. Both are very detrimental to your integrator's ability to be successful because that they... first end run you mentioned is literally just, I didn't like the answer I got from mom. I'm going to go to dad. Sometimes. Sometimes it's just a habit. I've been going to dad forever. You know, mom right. was never here. Because they're used right? to just the visionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The, the integrator right. might be the new so, kid on the block. So don't don't assume bad intent. Okay. Uh, you know, there, there are old habits that will take a little time, but but what when it does happen, you got to call it out. And you know, we want that visionary to do teach them what we call the question. And the question is, when someone comes to them, is you know, are you going to tell Benji or am I going to tell Benji? Because somebody's got to tell Benji. And so now, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in your office. I'm like, oh crap, I forgot. I was supposed to go talk to him. Uh, and so now it's awkward for me. So I'm probably not going to do that anymore. Right. And so when we see the visionary commit to using that question, then uh, you typically 30 days, you, you, you dry that side up. And then same thing for the visionary. When it happens, integrator visionary, you really want me to be successful, right? You got to stop doing that. I want you to talk to them, talk to them all you want, but please, you cannot give direction or make decisions mm-hmm. because that, that unwinds everything I'm, you probably That's my job. Do. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. What's the third rule? Third rule is the integrator is the tiebreaker. So we talked about that. So when the leadership team is at odds, they can't sort it out. The integrator swings in, hears both sides of the argument in the context of the greater vision and makes the call so we can get unstuck and and be moving forward again. Mm -hmm. Fourth one is that, uh, you know, you're an employee when working in the business. So an owner, this is the owner employee rules of the game, we call it. So owners, uh, think that they have a right to be an employee in the company, and they do not. There are what do you two mean rights. by that? 
Well, there's two rights that are inherent to being an owner in a business. One is I get my right to my share of the profits based on whatever percentage I own and however that works. Two is I have my right to a say in the major, major decisions of the business. So we're going to take on a new uh, investor. We're going to take on big debt. We're going to buy a building. We're going to sell a company. We're going to buy a company. You know, things like that, not the day-to-day stuff. Other than that, that's it. And so there's a this because of this assumption that I have as an owner a right to be an employee in the business, we get owners that show up in the business. They sit somewhere in the accountability chart, and then somebody tries to hold them accountable or give them direction or make a decision they don't like, and they reach in their back pocket, and they pull out this owner card, and they throw it down, and they go, yeah, that doesn't apply to me. I'm an owner. Interesting. And then, and then everybody kind of sits back and goes, well, this is all just uh, smoke and mirrors, and this isn't even real. Why are we, why, why are we even doing this? So, so you're not you're not saying you're not saying that a, an owner can't be an employee. An owner does have a right to be an employee within the business, just to be clear. A, but if they are, they have to play by the rules of the employees. Yeah, they, it's not, they're not they're not entitled to be an employee in the business. They have an mm-hmm. opportunity, just like anybody else we might hire, to be considered for a role in the business. But we should be putting the best person for the job in that seat. And if they're going to be in that seat, they frankly should be held to a higher standard than what we hold everybody else to. Mm-hmm. They, they, they've mm-hmm. got to play to our, they, they got to play to our core values. They got to you know what we call GWC that seat. They got to really be wired for it and 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 want it and be able to do it at the level it needs to be done and be held accountable for that, uh, just like anybody else. So I would see this happening a lot during this growth zone when you're sort of in this small to mid size range and your business is big enough that you have a a, a visionary integrator dynamic and you you are focusing on those big picture decisions. But but it's still but it's not at the size where you don't actually play some core functions in the business. You I could see you getting yourself into huge trouble with your team because using that using that owner card is just so seductive. Yeah, you can't help it. You yeah, know? It, it, and again, a lot of times it's it's a <clears throat> they've been taught that they saw somebody else doing that. Uh, it's just always been that way, so they don't even really think about the consequences of it. But when it comes down to it, it's a choice uh, of what's more important to you as an owner: mm-hmm. is your individual ego the most important thing, or is the success of this business? And it's a tough one, and and people wrestle mightily with that decision because they think they want what's best for the business, but boy, they just can't give up. Uh, I don't want somebody to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So that's the fourth. What's the fifth rule? Uh, The fifth one is to, is to maintain mutual respect. So, you know, this is about being eye level between that, that visionary integrator relationship. So I can't consider as visionary, I can't consider my integrator as something less than me. The integrator is not my minion. They're not there to do whatever I ask them. They're, they're really more like my partner. And mm-hmm. so I need to see them that way. And that integrator needs to see themselves that way. And they've got to be strong enough to lean back on me because a strong visionary will just mow down a weak integrator and they'll just run over them and they'll just, you know, do whatever they want. The integrator has got to be confident and push back. So we get this nice kind of kind of balance that's really it's based on mutual respect and we must never uh, above all else say anything bad about each other in front of anybody else in the company right uh, so so, the so, same way. so so yeah. so exactly exactly so you can't yeah. be out there going oh you know what i mean it's just uh, that's just again it unwinds the integrity of everything we're trying to do that mutual respect thing sounds really delicate and and challenging to mount to manage it from a few in a few ways, number one, visionaries tend to have a lot of swagger. And sometimes, you know, I, I'm not one of these people that thinks that ego is terrible and the root of all evil. There's a healthy amount of ego that you need and swagger that you need to do anything remarkable. Uh, but so visionaries have a, probably inherently more of that than most integrators. The second thing is the equity piece. In, in not, not, not every time, in not every example is the integrator going to own a 50 50 percent share so this this partnership thing is a conceptual uh, it's not that's actually right. that's not actually the case on the cap table so how do you have any thoughts on how to like just 
do that well because I I know there'd be a lot of visionaries who listen yep. to this go so, yeah this all so, sounds great I love it. it sounds good but then they get there and a year later they do the mowing down thing that you yep. mentioned so so the yeah I would say it's the very rare thing when that integrator is your certainly fifty fifty part I mean it you know it happens but you know the the comp for the integrator seat is all over the place sometimes there's equity sometimes there's not it's all different levels again it has to do with the situation that you're in. Um, but it's the it's the separation of ownership. So so whoever the owners are, they need to be doing their thing in, in what we call that owner's box, where they're meeting monthly. They're talking about whatever they need to talk about. They're reviewing the financials. Maybe the integrator is coming and making a presentation to them on the status of, you know, how things are going. Right. So they can ask questions. They can talk about. So we have all that. You know, they're in a sense are setting the high level direction of what we want this company to do. Do we want it to grow? fast? Do we want to be profitable now? Do we want to milk the cash out of it? What, what is it we're trying to do uh, from an owner's view? And then that information comes down, you know, through the visionary into the integrator and the rest of the organ to the rest of the organization to, to paint the picture, paint the direction, and then they go and execute. So we should be aligned. It, the vision should be aligned with that. The visionary and the integrator, that's where that work they got to do to be aligned on that becomes super important, right? And that's mm -hmm. those those same page meetings. If we are truly doing the work to be on the same page, then now we go out into the leadership team, we go out into the rest of the organization, and and we should be heading that stuff off proactively. The the situation where you know you got to put your fist down and 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 uh, you want to stop them because they're going in a a rogue direction on you that's contrary to what I want as an owner. That shouldn't happen. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I, frankly, I, I almost never see that happen. Right. The other one, I the other one I think is particularly challenging is is avoiding the the tampering, which is sort of a sub point under no end runs. I see this so often where we get a leadership team in place, or we 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 build up uh, we build up an accountabilities chart, but on certain little things, the visionary can't help but swoop down, meddle with a bunch of stuff that they feel very strongly about. And then basically exit and leave and go back to their own, you know back to their spot, and the team is left feeling really really frustrated, really frustrated and really demotivated because they thought they were doing some pretty good work there, and now all of a sudden as someone has come in with no context by the way and just said I like it this way, do it that way, see you later. I got to go do my visionary level stuff. So it's just another really common one I've seen a lot that I think is challenging. Uh, what about IDS? What, what is IDS and what role does it play in long-term success? So uh, IDS is, uh, again, in, in EOS language, that's our issue-solving protocol. It stands for identify, discuss, and solve. So issues are things that we need to figure out. They're, they're things that are either problems we need to solve or opportunities we need to figure out how to take advantage of, you know, situations we need to talk about, information we need to exchange, uh, it could be any any of those buckets, but you know you gather all those things up, and when you're together as a team, you prioritize from that list. And you go, okay, if we could solve one thing on this list right now, uh, if we could knock it out, you know, fix it, solve it forever, which is the one that would help us the most? And so you prioritize mm -hmm. it, and you pick pick three to start with, and then you start into that first one. And you, what's really the issue here? You know, who who are you asking? What do you need from them? And kind of try to capsulize the issue. Then you talk it out in the context as much as you need to, to discuss it, to understand it. And let's say there's a decision that needs to be made. We figure out who the decision maker is. They may want input from others on the team. And ultimately, once they feel like they've got the information uh, to solve it, they, they make that decision. So we identify it. We discuss it. We solve it. So the solve could be a decision. It could be a, a to-do, an action item that comes out of there that somebody needs to take away. Uh, lots of different things, but that's really the issue solving track uh, for how you deal with all the things that get on your radar as issues uh, that we need to we need to solve. We need to figure out. We need to deal with at some point. That makes sense. It makes total sense. I, I identify, discuss, solve. Let's just to be clear. Yeah, I just think, to be clear. And, and the and the trap here, just to be clear, is that discuss piece. 
because what most teams will do, not really understanding what they're trying to achieve, is they'll, okay, here's an issue, and they'll just discuss, 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 and they'll just kind of keep going around and around, and they're saying the same things over and over. And so, if you, again, if you're clear on who the decider is, let's say it's a call that needs to be made, and once you kind of start hearing the same thing said over and over, then, you know, we've probably discussed it enough, and, you know, let's, let's we're trying to solve this thing, so what's, what's the solve? Um, I, I see that you know, it, it, in all transparency. We, we do that in our organization. I'm sure lots of people do where we talk and we talk and we talk. And there's lots of great – I mean the ideas that are generated are great. But they slip off into the ether because there's some link near the bottom of the chain. Either the the true shot caller, the decision maker, isn't present or isn't paying attention, or it's we don't have a clear next action step. Next next action step in the critical path. There's all sorts of reasons, but um, it is shock. It seems so simple when you say it, but it is shockingly common how how often stuff just sort of gets talked about for quarters or years. Yeah. And nothing ever yeah. happens as a result. And, and here, here's the other trap is, you know, just because it just came up right now doesn't mean that this is when the best time is for us to talk about it. Right. So that's the idea of having a list, an issues list to kind of, okay, you know, this thing came up. Yeah, boom, let's add that to the issues list. Because otherwise, Mark and Benji may talk about it for 20 minutes. And then we get to the end of the 20 minutes and we realize, you know what, we needed Sam here to to have this conversation fully so we're gonna have to repeat that whole 20 minutes again with sam and we'll never get our 20 minutes back again right Right. and so it's it's let's let's put it in a holding place unless it's something critical urgent that we have to do right this minute and then we deal with it in our you know our level 10 meeting or, or or whenever we're together working on issues and we do it from a priority standpoint so we don't work on that and use all of our time and then we didn't work on that other thing that was actually the bigger more impactful thing um, do you, it's just a practical question. Do you actually, I mean, where does your issues list sit? Is this on a big Asana board or is it in a piece of software? Is it a piece of paper? Like there's got to be a centralized place where stuff people can brain. It's not just one person. The team can brain dump issues and then you can easily sort through in terms of priority. Yep. What do you do in your businesses to capture all that in a way that you can go back to easily and prioritize easily? Yep. So we have a platform called EOS One, mm. and so it's exactly that. So it's it's basically set up to support an organization that's running on EOS, and the the meeting structures that we have, and uh, the level ten meetings, and, and all of that at all levels through the organization. So that's where uh, that's where we do it. Uh, but you can use you know other systems, uh, Asana. I mean, there's different things that you know people use for project management yeah. or, or or whatever uh, to support you know this piece of you know what's on our radar and. And how do we move that into action? But it's definitely not in the mind of the visionary. That's not a good spot for it. No, I, I know. I, I know where everything is. It's all up here. That's probably a red flag. That should be a nice empty field of grass with blue skies and butterflies. <laughs> totally. Um, okay, a couple, <laughs> couple other questions to knock off here. I got one on behalf of our integrator listeners. And this goes back to something I said earlier. Uh, You just mentioned there are way more visionaries than there are integrators uh, out there in society. I would also make the case, and uh, this is the cynic in me coming out, but here it is. I think there's a lot of people that think they're visionaries who just have a lot of ideas, maybe crippling ADD and a colorful imagination. Um, And I think that there's a difference. I think that there's a difference between those two things. How does an integrator who's, you know, maybe working for someone and they're feeling like this business is yes, cool, but whatever. I want to I want to play a bigger game. I want to get I want to I want to execute a really fun and exciting vision that I'm excited about. Do you have and we're putting ourselves squarely in the seat of an integrator right now. Do you have any thoughts around how they can tell the difference between a true visionary and just an ideas guy? So here's here's where my mind goes on that question, Benji. It's uh a, a true visionary has a very clear picture of where they're trying to go. And, and you know, the, the end state of what it is that they're trying to, to accomplish and, you know, where they want to be. Okay. So an, an, an idea guide for, you know, use your terminology. Uh, I mean, you know, they, they may just may be throwing things out in all different direction, but a visionary really has a, has a sense of the overall direction. 
I'm trying to get to there. Mm-hmm. I want this to be true. I want to, you know, make this dent in the universe, right? That's they, they, they're, they're tied to something like that and all the different pathways that could lead us from here to there. Yeah. There's lots of different versions of that. Uh, and that's what they're going to have different ideas about, mm-hmm. but they're anchored in that big thing on the far horizon. Does that make sense? So, so the, the destination is something that is super clear and quite detailed. The pathways to the destination, there's room for conversation. There's room for different ideas. That's kind of where the creative part comes in. But one thing that is somewhat non-negotiable, if I'm hearing you correctly, is the end state that they're trying to get to. I think I'd say that it's consistent. Right. It doesn't move around every day. It doesn't move around every week. It probably doesn't move around very much at all. It's all because it may be... 20 years out there, right? It, it, I mean, it may be pretty far down the road, uh, but they know I want to be, I want to build something that's this big, you know, uh, you know, EOS worldwide, we want to have a hundred thousand companies running on EOS, right? Uh, that's not changing for a while, you know, took us a while to get to 10,000, but you know, we keep going from there. Um, so it's, it's, it's having that anchor on the horizon, the visionary, that comes from them. So uh, it, certainly in the beginning, later on, the leadership team has a lot to do with that and shaping that. But really, it's a, certainly originally inspired by the by the visionary. If I was an integrator, then I would be asking this visionary, this theoretical visionary, and I shouldn't say ideas guy. It could be an ideas woman as well. Um, <clears throat> I would be asking them about this vision, and I would be paying very careful attention to the level of detail and how high resolution the image in their mind is versus low resolution. And I'd also be paying close attention to consistency week to week, month to month about that vision. And those would be telltales. I think that would tell you a lot about the strength or lack thereof of said visionary. Yeah. So, so again, systematically in, in EOS, you know, we're very intentional about, about crafting a 10 year target or a core target that sits out there on, you know, call it a 10-year horizon, mm-hmm. right? It's, it may not be the end-all, be-all of what the visionary is seeing, but it's a boom. It's a point out there pretty far. Now, that may not have a lot of detail. Again, that may be the 100,000 companies. That may be the, you know, 25,000 houses or, you know, whatever, right? Whatever your, your thing is. Um, then we bring that camera in closer to a three-year picture, now, at three years, it's closer. So that's where I want to be able to see some more detail. That's where I want to be able to see some more context. You know, uh, how, what's our revenue? What's our profit? How many people do we have? Uh, you know, what are other key measurables that we may have? What, what, what does it look like? You know, what, what, what are the things that you look around and see that if those were true, you'd be like, hell yeah, that's awesome. I get excited about that. And so that's another attribute of that visionary is to be able to help paint that picture that's, it's exciting and motivating. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something that people want to get on board with and, mm-hmm. and, and help make happen, help, help go do. It gets everybody aligned in that place, and it challenges them to think differently about how we're doing stuff today because we look at how we're doing it today, and we look at this place that, that the visionary has helped us paint, and it's kind of like, man, we're never going to get there if we keep trying to do it like this. So we got to change some things. That's where the new ideas and, and all that stuff starts to come in and, and fill those gaps. I like that. I, I, that's, a, that's a really good answer. The long-term picture, it's okay to be somewhat undefined, but it needs to be anchored on a few core things that the visionary thinks is really important. But the, the, medium, the medium-term picture actually is pretty detailed. That is, that is higher resolution, and they're able to talk about it pretty confidently. It's a good, it's a good way to, to organize one's thoughts around it. And, the, and then the one-year plan is very concrete. Crystalline. It's, it's frankly, it's a prediction and we, we better hit it. Right. And so the, the beauty of this is we get to use both sides of that brain, right? We get to use the executional side, you know, kind of from 12 months on down to, to be, this is the stuff we know how to do it. We just got to go make it happen. It's all about execution and being, being good predictors. But then beyond that kind of three years and beyond, it's about, uh, Motivation. It's about uh, you know uh, attraction and alignment, right? And 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 triggering that creative side of the brain by stretching to some place we don't know how to get to. I don't know how, but I think it's possible. It's not inconceivable to me, uh, but we just got to figure it out. And so you start to use both sides of that brain uh, together across the team, and that's how big things happen. So, 
This is the last. This is the last question I wanted to pick your brain on. Um, one thing that we, that we haven't talked about, but is is a, an unfortunate. You could say it's even a sad reality of business, broadly speaking. Visionaries and integrators can outgrow each other. And I'm wondering if you can explain how and why that happens and, and what we ought to do about it when it does. Yeah, great. So let's go back to the three-piece puzzle, right? So visionary, integrator, business. And so none of those three pieces are static. Right. Everything's changing right. all the time. And so, you know, visionaries are growing, Integrators are growing. Their worlds are changing individually. Their you know personal worlds are changing. How how much they're continuing to grow and develop as as a leader, as a you know in terms of whatever capabilities that they may have. Uh, their ambitions may be changing. Uh, all that's happening. Same time they're riding on top of this train. That's the business that's going somewhere. And so you know you you look at that train and that visionary integrator spectrum today versus what it looks like five years from now, and it can change. It can change quite a bit. And so we're always kind of checking for that fit. Again, thinking about it as puzzle pieces, do the pieces still fit? And sometimes we uh, we outgrow the company. Sometimes the company outgrows us. Sometimes we one of us outgrows the other uh, as far as the visionary or the integrator. And so when that happens, we just need to recognize it. Sometimes we see it coming. We feel it coming. And we can kind of start to have that have that discussion. Maybe it's the visionary that wants to leave. Uh, you know, they, they they're ready to move on. They they want to do something completely different. They want to, you know, just ride off into the sunset. You know, whatever it may be. Sometimes the integrator wants more opportunity than they're getting. Right. Uh, you know, the vision's not big enough the for them. Vision's not big enough for them, right? Or the company's not supporting their ability to execute, right? I mean, there's lots of different reasons, right? But it happens. And so when it happens, it's the same process that we talked about before. Let's back into what's the shape of that missing piece, and let's go find it. Mm -hmm. And so you know, when we wrote the book, we were really thinking about it primarily from the perspective of the visionary always trying to find that missing integrator piece. But since then, uh, we've seen numerous times companies that are actually the visionary ends up being the missing piece. And it's again, because that visionary moved on, uh, maybe it was a, uh, maybe it was a, a family business that's been handed down a couple of times and the next generation or the next generation wasn't that visionary that their father or grandfather or a grandmother might've been. And, and so, you know, it works the same can way. Can you bring you that piece in? Shape of that. Can you bring that piece you in? Because, you know, here's the thing. You kind of make an assumption that the visionary personality is the one who gets things started. And so they they are you, that's not really a need, but it's sort of, yeah, it's like it's, it, I was, I've been thinking this the whole time. I'm like, if you have an, if you have a business where they've got lots of integrator, but not enough visionary, how does that work? Bringing someone in and saying, Hey, uh, steer the ship for us. I mean, has that, can that be yeah. successful? It, it, it can be successful. And in fact, EOS Worldwide is now on its third visionary. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, Gino, he had his plan for when he wanted to move on. And, and we brought in Mike Payton. And Mike Payton served in that visionary seat for a period of time. And then now we've got Mark O'Donnell in that visionary seat. And each time it was either an intentional, uh, well, every time it was an intentional transition plan that said, hey, you know, I, I kind of want to go do something different. Uh, we need to find somebody to do this. Okay, what does it look like based on where we're trying to go? What does the shape of that puzzle piece look like? Let's go find one and let's be really uh, thorough about how we do that search and then bring them in and have a plan for how we're going to transition them in. Uh, you know, the, the big difference about bringing in a visionary is it, I would say it almost always involves equity. All right. Which is Fair not enough. really a surprise because, I mean, you know, they're the starters of things, so they, they have equity when they start it themselves. If they don't start it themselves, they're still kind of wired like that, so that's something that they – is just kind of part of what they're after. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, probably no surprise to anybody that that's, that's a common part of the compensation equation when you bring in a visionary from the outside. So you guys, you guys practice what you preach. I love it. Um, well, I should mm -hmm. say it this way, Benji. We learn – just like everybody else does. Right. So we're not perfect. And, you know, we're an entrepreneurial company too. And so we're, we're growing and, and, uh, figuring things out and, and trying to, trying mm -hmm. to learn, learn as we do it. Um, vision without execution is hallucination. 
I think is a nice way to sum up this conversation. It's a great line from the book. <laughs> Uh, and it's so, so true. I think this is, uh, Mark, I just want to th- uh, thank you for the wisdom you've shared. I know we went long here, but it just was so full of uh, gold that I couldn't cut it off. Where can people find out more? about If people want to connect with you or the EOS world, uh, where would you direct people to do that? Yeah, so Mark C. Winters is pretty much me anywhere. So MarkCWinters.com. Uh, Mark C. Winters is my handle on pretty much all the socials. So LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Uh, so just remember that. So I start there. Uh, for visionaries and integrators, RocketFuelUniversity.com is the place to go. And uh, we have a, a community there of visionaries and integrators. And we have calls every month so you can go and sign up for that i've got some video based training on there that's that's you know it's it's free so you can get on there and you can you can kind of dive deep into a lot of the stuff out of the book uh if you if you like to listen to it and consume it that way i probably tell some different stories there um and then eosworldwide.com those are the best ways to find us and and uh, hopefully help 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 you move down whatever path it is you're trying to go down I really appreciate you doing this with me. It's been a ton of fun to uh, to chat with you, and thank you so much for your time today, Mark. My pleasure, Benji. Nice to talk to you. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.